I have heard the parable of the sower and the seed many times at this point. There's a detail about it that I want to look at today, something that uh, I don't know if I've paid a lot of attention to before. The story as it goes, Jesus tells is of some seed being cast out and some falls on the path where it is blown away. Other seed falls on rocky soil where it starts to grow and then something gets hard and it, it shrivels. And, and then there's a seed that falls among the thorns and the weeds and it grows and it is strangled. And then there's the seed that falls on the good soil and it, and it grows and has a great yield. To hear the interpretation that Jesus gives, the, the seed that falls on the path is the seed, is the word of God, the good news, and it is swept away. And it is not, nothing, there's no response. And then there is the seed that falls amongst the rocks, and someone gets excited. I'm going to follow Jesus now. Yippee! And then the first time something hard happens. Well, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to forgive. Well, uh, never mind that. All right. And then there's the, the seed that falls under the good soil and grows and grows. It's the seed that falls among the thorns that we're going to look at specifically, though. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, and the lure of wealth, choke the word, and it yields nothing. Which is quite the harsh indictment. If you sow seed, if you plant seed, you take some time and effort to do that, to yield nothing... That's not what you want. That, that's pretty barren, right? This is uh, Adam Hamilton. He wrote, wrote a book called Enough about simplicity and generosity. And that's why uh, he points this out. And we're going to be using that for part of what you hear today and in following weeks. So he points, uh, Jesus points this out about the, the rocky soil. But it's not just what Jesus has to say. It happens other times in Scripture that this is pointed out. Paul talks about this and when he's warning uh, his protege, another leader in the church, Timothy. He writes to him and says, you, you're familiar with the first part. The love of money is the root of all evils. We've heard that before. It's the rest of the sentence that it, we need to hear today. The love of money is the root of all evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced their hearts with many pains. It is through this craving, right? It is not that the money itself is a risk. And we, if money didn't exist, we would invent it. Like we, money is a way to store value. It's a way to, uh, to expedite uh, trade. Like we would invent money if it didn't exist. So it's not the money itself, it's the risk. It's the love of money, the craving of money, that, as Paul uses that word, that has led people away from the faith and to be pierced with many pains. It's a temptation that is common to all people. Like when, when Jesus is going to be tempted, he, Jesus is uh, born, and then down the road he is baptized, and then he goes into the wilderness. And, and if you remember, the wilderness in Scripture is where you learn about yourself. The wilderness is sort of a school. All right, so he goes in the wilderness and he is tempted in the temptations. One of the temptations that Jesus faces, the, it's a common temptation to all humanity. The temptation is here, I'll give you all the toys. I'll give you all the stuff. Right? Satan takes Jesus and says, I will give you all the kingdoms and everything therein. Right? And this is like going up to me and saying, Andy, I will give you all the computers, all the audio, every video game, and all the pens you'd ever want. Right? This is, you can have all the toys you want. Are you going to resist? Are you going to accept the temptation to the things you want, the things, or are you going to uh, follow your Father's plan? And so Jesus faces the, t this temptation, and, and uh, so will we. This temptation that leads to being choked, much like uh, the, the, the weeds choke in on a plant. Now, I think that we live in a culture where there are a lot of people who are being choked by, by this. There's a lot of weeds happening right now. The average credit card debt right now for a household is about 16 grand. Can you save if you're servicing a $16,000 debt with a, what's the average interest rate on a credit card? Anyone know that off the top? Any bankers in here might know that off the top of their head? <laughs> it's high, right? <laughs> the average new car loan is $30,000. It's actually $30,032. Uh, and, and then that leads to a payment of $503 a month. Like, I remember my, my dad, and I, we, went, when we went and we bought the, we got a Dodge Dakota in the 90s. And I remember my dad harumphing, like, 
Andy, these trucks got too expensive. For fourteen thousand dollars for a truck, what are they thinking? Right? <laughs> But now we're taking out loans for 30 grand to buy a vehicle, average. The average college uh, graduate has $37,000 in debt, which is a real problem. Because if you graduate with 37 grand in debt, what aren't you going to do? House? They're getting married and kids? And here's the scary one, start a business. Our rate of small business creation is dropping because like, if you're gonna start a business, you can crash with your parents, live on ramen, but those student loans don't care. Like after six months, they wanna get paid. That's just how it is, right? <laughs> Among working age families, the median amount set aside for retirement is five grand. Now, median, there's a difference there. If I say average, if someone inherited $3 million, that would throw off averages, because averages can get skewed by really high numbers and really, known, really low numbers. Median is the most common amount, right? Most families, the most common amount of, of money that families have saved for retirement is five grand, which will last all of about three months. Which leads to the, the last sort of unsurprising statistic. Half of Americans, their income and their expenses are the same, right? So half of Americans, they're just living paycheck to paycheck, and that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. And to, so it's not that, again, to have money is not a sin. It's the sin is the love of money and the things and to fall in love, in a sense, with the weeds that choke, to choke off. And I think we're seeing that in our culture, the temptation there, it, it, there, there is a real temptation. And what drives this is something that starts out truly good. I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you take a good idea and you push it too far, sometimes you can get in trouble. Like, if, if you start, for example, if you start working out and you work one side of a muscle set, but not the other, what happens? Right, you can work out and work out and work out and lift weights, but if you work one side of the arm but not the, uh, the back side, you work biceps but not your triceps, you'll pull your shoulder out of joint. Wouldn't that be awkward? You work out so much, working out a good thing, that you throw, you pull your shoulder. It's, it's, it's a bad thing, right? In the same way, the American dream, it's a good idea. What is the American dream? You want your kids to do better, and it would be nice to own a house along the way. Is that a good summation? Well, you want your kids to do better, own a house. That's not a bad thing, right? What happens is the American dream can become warped and turned into a nightmare by focusing on all the stuff we put in the house and then paying for it all on credit. Like, and this is, again, not a surprise. I, for me, every time I watch a truck ad, I, I see this, this sense on we have to have more and bigger and better. And what is the one thing that is advertised with every truck ad you've ever seen? They're gonna have more power, right? And I wonder to myself, I owned a 99 Ranger. It had a little V6 in it, and it allowed me to move furniture, and my Christmas tree, and boxes, and I moved across country in it. I don't think that 20 years later, I need more power than I had back in 19... Does anyone need more power in the truck? Are you going to pay for it, though? Well, that's the American dream, right? More power, more, more and bigger. And uh, it shows up in our houses, too. The average size of a house since 1973 was 1,660 square foot. The average height, size, size of a house in 2016 is 2,700 square foot. Why do we have bigger houses? Well, we've got to put all that stuff somewhere, right? Like, I have all this stuff, and we have bigger stuff, and more stuff, and, and we pay for it. The first time I, I understood the concept of credit was I heard this phrase, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Y'all, you don't hear that? Who, who said that? Wimpy, right? That's old Popeye. That, that's been a few years, hasn't it? Uh, Popeye would say that. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Credit card debt not now is at $16,000 a household. Back in 1990, it was at three grand a household was the average credit card debt. And so we need more ways to pay for things. And so we have invented something called the home equity loan. 
I'm going to have an opinion about banking here, and, and feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I don't think the home equity loan is a, is a wise thing. Because the, one of the best ideas in America in the last century was the GI Bill, right? You have all these people coming back from the war, and you say, we're going to give you education, and we're going to make sure you own a house. And those, those are powerful things. And you own a house, what do you do? You pay on it. And then you pay it off, and then your house increases in value. I can't think of anything else that has more driven, that has had a greater impact on the growth of middle class in America than you buy a house, you pay it off, and you have an asset of increasing value. And what's a home equity loan do? Here, let's suck all of that increased value out of the home. Right? Why do we need to do that? I, I am sure there are good and solid reasons to do a home equity loan. I haven't found them yet. <laughs> I, if I haven't said it before or often enough, I'll say it again. I reserve the right to be wrong, and I might have just exercised it. But I think that's what we're seeing. I think we have this problem that we are tempted to have more and more stuff and to pay for it tomorrow. And what we are learning to do is to embrace and love the weeds that choke us. The, the, that, they, that weeds that choke us so that we cannot grow and, and, and grow and become spiritually mature. As we explore this so over this week and the coming weeks, I do have a request. I am the only person who knows what's in my heart. I'm the one who knows my temptations, and I share them with you freely. You just heard my list, right? Uh, please look in the mirror, and let's not poke at each other. It is uh, one of the greatest signs I've ever seen on a church was just down the road, on the Christian church, where it said for a while, we are called to be witnesses, not judges and lawyers. Isn't that perfect, right? As we talk about temptation, and stuff and generosity this is not a time to 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 accuse each other this is a time to look in the mirror and, and deal with our own baggage we are all tempted right <coughs> and we all have this temptation we all have to grapple with it and what jesus tells us about this temptation it's in john 10 the thief satan comes only to steal and kill and destroy i come that they might have life and have it abundantly if you want to talk about the nature of Satan, that's a fun discussion. That's a different sermon. But the temptation there is real. And, and the nature of the temptation around these weeds is that we think that the way to, if you want to destroy your life, like if you go out this afternoon and commit adultery or embezzle money or kill somebody, you can, kill, you can destroy your life quickly. But you can also destroy your life slowly too. Right? To, to live a life such that you seek with that you sink into a sea of debt what does that do you always remain focused inwards on yourself on your things and paying off your debt and never learn the joy of generosity to focus on owning so much stuff that you're not sure if you own the stuff or the stuff owns you and protecting that stuff become, becomes a wall between you and your neighbor right to focus so much on the american dream that we pursue it until it becomes a nightmare and we never seek God's dream. And to all of this, Scripture warns us and guides us and helps us see. Scripture has a lot to say about money. It's a rather constant re refrain. Ecclesiastes tells us, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. In Matthew, uh, Jesus warns us, What will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? There's no place you can buy your soul back once it's been encroached on by the weeds, right? In Proverbs, what we read earlier, two things I ask you, do not deny them. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need or I shall be full and deny you and say who is the Lord or I shall be poor and steal and profane, profane the name of my God. I think it is a fascinating trend in the history of Israel, if you read in Scripture. It is when Israel is doing best economically that they do the worst spiritually. Right? When they have a golden age economically, you, they end up saying, I don't need God because I can depend upon myself. I don't think it's an, a mistake or happenstance that the verse, keep me from lying, is right next to keep me from being too rich. 
because if you're too rich, it might lead to the lie that I can do it all myself, I have all I need, I don't need God, right? There's a connection there. My friends, we do need to hear some good news about this, and the good news is that life, true, abundant life, is in following Jesus, a faith that leads to loving neighbors and true friendships, a way of life that has purpose and direction, a way of life that is beautiful and rich and satisfying, that loves its creator and not the created. And I think we can find examples of, of this life, of, of this joy. Um, one of the places that... Uh, we see this is in there's a the shakers. You all know about shaker furniture. You've heard heard of this a, a Christian tradition, an American Christian tradition, and they made this furniture that was simple and amazingly well built. And, and while they they also they built, they also composed some hymns. And one of them we sing on occasion. If you've if last week we sang it, that was not the plan. That wouldn't have worked. Out, that would have worked out better if we sang it today. But uh, uh, Lord of the Dance. Right, Lord of the Dance, have, there are different words to it, and I, and I admit that I like the original words better. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, it will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. I like those words a lot better. To turn and turn until we come around right. That, that the very word repentance means to turn. And it is turning as a way of life. Turning together. And I believe that as a church we are called to turn together. To be an embassy of the kingdom of God. A place where the kingdom in which we live according to what Jesus says happens. As we are turning towards practical ways of, of, of experiencing that God gives us enough that we can be generous, and we can practice ways of living that are different. Like, and whether it is learning to practice Christmas without any debt, or, or build houses at the right sizes for our needs, I don't know what they will be, but the church is the place to turn and turn until we come round right. Before we spend any time in the coming weeks looking at how we handle wealth, how do we handle having enough. We need to be clear that this in the end is a question of what is beautiful because we can talk about this all day long and if we remain, uh, if we think the weeds are beautiful, right? If we are the seed trying to grow and if we are running towards the weeds and embracing them, then, then we will get nowhere. Nowhere. Instead of, of running towards greed and envy and materialism, the invitation of Jesus Christ is to run towards him and to find a life of generosity, a life of joy, a life of purpose, a life that knows that it is not the things that make the life worth living. It is the people that we live with and the Lord that we follow. Let us pray. Lord, help us to be grateful for what we have remembering that we don't need most of what we want and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. Amen.